My name's Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas. This week, a conversation about literature, the human brain, and umami with editor at large from Seed Magazine, Jonah Lehrer, author of Proust Was a Neuroscientist. These artists have intuitively figured out how, how art should resonate, how art can resonate in the mind. You know, I hope this book is merely suggestive. I, I, I hope it just begins a dialogue about how art and science might, might be able to inform each other. I also don't think I could have just picked anybody. Um, I mean, I, I chose these artists because they were some of my favorite artists, but also because I think I, I, I could tell particularly interesting stories about their own art and about the, the science they anticipated. But, but certainly, I think you know you can also look at you learn a lot about the visual cortex by studying Jackson Pollock. You know, I, I could have talked about Samuel Taylor Coleridge and the imagine. I mean, there's so many artists I left out of the book who I wanted to put in, but for reasons of, of base and stuff, had had to leave out. Certainly, these. Eight artists aren't an exhaustive list. They are merely, I hope, just a mere suggestion. Every single interview from the Marketplace of Ideas is available on our online archive. Visit us at www.colinmarshallradio.com slash marketplace. You can download each show or you can stream any of them in your browser. My guest is Jonah Lehrer, editor-at-large at Seed Magazine and author of Proust Was a Neuroscientist. Jonah, welcome to the Marketplace of Ideas. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I know you've trotted out the thesis for your book about a thousand times by now. It's post-book tour and all that. So why don't instead we go back to the genesis of the book and to a piece that your biographical information never fails to mention. Back to your lab work as an undergrad at Columbia. What were you doing there? Um, I was a lab technician in the lab of Eric Kandel. And lab technicians kind of, they're the manual laborers of neuroscience um, or, or any molecular biology lab. Um, you do all the kind of nitty gritty day to day experiments. And what sort of sub regions of neuroscience were you working on in those experiments you were in your capacity as a technician involved with? The, the lab I was working in studied the chemistry of memory, what happens in your brain whenever you make a memory. Um, and they actually used um, an invertebrate sea slug as the model. So we were studying the neurons in the sea slug and, and trying to kind of figure out what exactly happened in these cells, um, not, not brain cells because they didn't quite have a brain, um, but in these cells whenever the sea slug remembered anything. Um, and, and its memories, of course, were simple muscle memories. Um, it, it wasn't having elaborate Proustian memories. It was just remembering the last time we touched it. I've had a few friends who have done lab work, and some of them find it exhilarating. Some find it just incredibly tedious. And where did you yourself fall on that spectrum? Both. I think, I think it's absolutely both exhilarating and incredibly tedious. Most of your experiments, of course, will fail. Um, it's, and, and, and that's where the tedium comes in. You'll spend weeks or months um, doing these experiments and realize at the end that they, that they weren't working. Um, but 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 that tedium is punctuated by these tremendous moments of exhilaration, which are, of course, incredibly rare, where an experiment will work and you'll learn something new. You'll have this little brick of knowledge, um, and, and, and that's an incredible feeling to discover something that you think, at least, no one else has ever found. And, and often, the, this revelation is incredibly mundane and, and banal. It's, you know, no one else will even care but you. Because you found the synaptic protein does this, um, you know, some some minor detail, and yet in the moment it's incredibly exhilarating. So so you know it, it's both. Um, most days I'd get home and and just be depressed that I'd wasted eight hours or ten hours or twelve hours trying, you know, and killed ten poor sea slugs, um, and the experiment didn't work for for whatever unknown reason. Um, and yet then there were those days. Um, when, when it did work. How many times were you able to get that brick of knowledge that gave you the acceleration, that knowledge speedball there? Probably not enough. You know, my postdoc who I worked for probably wished I had generated a few more bricks. Um, he'd always joke that I excelled at experimental failure. Um, I, I certainly wasn't the world's finest technician. 
but but it probably you know it, it probably happened about once a month, and I was in the lab for four years. I mean, once a month maybe a little optimistic, um, but you know we. We didn't make enough bricks to publish a few papers. During your academic career, what was your original path? What goal were you heading toward? Was this the preparation for what you thought would be a career in pure science on, on the bench doing work for the rest of your career? Or um, Yeah, I think, I think that's why I originally started working in the lab. Um, I, I'd always loved the brain and, and always wanted to, I think, go into neuroscience. Um, and I certainly went into college with the intention of, of being a neuroscience major or a neurologist or doing something with these three pounds of gelatinous flesh. Um, and, and, and then I kind of took a few literature classes and, and fell in love with that, too, which complicated things and ended up as a double major in neuroscience and English, um, but, but worked in a lab throughout my undergraduate career. What was it like to juggle the disparate course loads there of the neuroscience and the literature majors? It was wonderful. Um, you know, it could be slightly bipolar. Um, so, you know, you'd be drawing all these connections that made no sense to anybody else but you. Um, <laughs> you know, muttering to yourself about, you know, about the latest novel you just read and, and how that related to the computational neuroscience class you were taking. But 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 in, in general, it, it, it was pretty thrilling. It, it was wonderful to be stretched in such a different direction. Were you able to get your neuroscience friends to mingle with your literature friends easily? There, there definitely were two cultures I wasn't happening. Um, <laughs> the two cultures two, in microcosm. Cultures, yeah, yeah. I mean, Facebook may have made things easier. Um, <laughs> but this was a time right before Facebook where I definitely had two groups of friends. I had my, you know, pre-med science friends, yeah, many of whom were, we were stepping through organic chemistry and molecular biology together and, and, and all the science requirement classes and bonding over just how awful Orgo was. And then there were the friends talking about the latest postmodern novel you had to read for class. So, so, so there definitely were two cliques I was a part of. Um, but that was part of the fun, too. In the story of the, the genesis of your book, Proust was a neuroscientist, you describe yourself as doing lab work and then to relieve some of the downtime, the tedium of the downtime, you picked up the Proust. Now, was Proust an assignment for the literature major, or was it just something that you came to yourself? Swan's Way was assigned for, it was a um, uh, French modernism class. Um, and so, I mean, the, there's a tremendous amount of downtime as a tech in the lab. You're always, you're always waiting for experiments to finish, for a gel to run out, or, you know, or, or neurons to be digested by a restriction enzyme, or whatever. And so, and so I brought Swan's Way originally, and it's the first novel in the Proustian epic, um, while I was waiting for an experiment to finish. And, and then I got hooked and ended up reading the whole Proustian soap opera um, while, while waiting for other experiments to finish. And, and that, that was where I got the idea, you know, halfway through the novel. I eventually realized that Proust had this incredibly modern notion of how our memory worked, and that his fiction had, in a sense, anticipated the experiments I was doing in the lab. Did you think that that idea could work as a full-length book when you happened upon it, or was this this more of a... Because it did become an article. Would you think you thought it was more of an article and just an article, or did you envision the book in your mind as this came to you? At, at first, I just thought it was... God, this guy, Proust, was, was pretty prescient. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I had no sense that I could ever write a book about it. I didn't even imagine myself writing a book. So I just thought it was kind of this nifty thing um, that, that Proust is, you know, had had written all these lines um, about how his memory worked that that really were very modern and that anticipated these very recent science experiments. So so I, I I certainly didn't see it as a book at first. I mean it's only later on, you know, so I looked at all my other favorite art from Walt Whitman to Virginia Woolf um, through the same prism of neuroscience that that I really had the idea for the book. At the time when when you got that initial idea when you realized what Proust saw in his day, did you try to? to tell that idea to your fellow scientists in training? And what did they think if you did? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I definitely, um, I, I had the pleasure of working for a postdoc who, who was just a tremendous intellectual. Um, we had many conversations about Saul Bellow and Marquez, those are two of his favorite authors. So I immediately told him about my, my grand Proustian idea, these, these very strange and silly connections I was making. And, and he, was, he was very encouraging. And um, we exchanged many ideas throughout the, process of, of kind of working on the book, uh, you know, about which authors we thought might actually be neuroscientists. Um, so so he, 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 his name is Kaslik C, and I talk about him in the book. 
um, he, he really was incredibly supportive. And that's kind of an uncommon interest for scientists to have for yourself and him. What what was different about you two that was different from the other people in the lab, the ones who weren't picking up the Proust or perhaps literature of any kind? You know, I think in general, scientists really are tremendous intellectuals. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, there were, I'd, I'd often go to museum with other scientists um, in the lab. I mean, maybe I was in a freakishly um, omnivorous lab, but um, but but you know, I can only speak for the scientists I know um, well enough to to know which novels they read and. They pretty much all read novels. That is one of my favorite things about scientists. You have to overgeneralize. They really are, I think, tremendous intellectuals. Eric Kendall, for example, the scientist who, who oversaw the lab. Um, it was his lab. Um, you know, he's a great fan of, of German art and collects Egon Schiele and Klim sketches. Um, I, I'm not sure it was quite as unusual as, as it may seem in the abstract. Um, scientists really are a curious group of people. Well, I'm glad to hear that at least one stereotype here is, is less than true, or at least where you were. And neuroscience might be a, a, a you know, slight outlier. Um, neuroscientists, I, I should say, um, I, I think do have a penchant for trying to understand the mind in other ways. Do you think you w- that you wouldn't find the same sort of phenomenon in, say, a crowd of physicists? I'm not sure. Um, you know, I, I know I know a few physicists who are who are very curious people who you know will talk about string theory and Richard Serra sculptures in the same breath. Scientists are, are in general, and, and we're of course overgeneralizing here, um, are, are a very curious, interested group of people in the world beyond science. That said, I think the way the way science has to be done now so reductionist, it's so specific. It's very tough to know how to bring these other knowledges you may know about, these other cultures you may be interested in, to bear on your science. You know, when you're studying some synaptic protein in a sea slug, even if you've read Proust or Love, Saul Bellow, or have read all the other novelists, it's tough to figure out how these two cultures can actually mesh. And I think that's the problem. Um, even when scientists, you know, really are curious about other ways of knowing, the, the way of scientific, the, the pursuit of scientific knowledge is such a specific pursuit. Um, and it can often be so narrow that it's tough to figure out how, how these other cultures may actually intersect. And from there, from that work in the lab you were doing, how did you develop skill at writing for a general reader? Because even for literature students, that's not a hugely common skill. That gets highly specialized as well, especially in the upper levels. So what was your, your journey from there to writing, for example, for Seed, for, for, a, for the public, essentially? My, my first article for Seed was called Bruce was a Neuroscientist. That was the first article I'd ever written. Um, and, it was, and it was about this, this crazy idea I had in the lab one day. Um, um, and, and from there, it really was, I, you know, I just, it was just luck. I, I had some great editors, um, from my book editor, Amanda Cook, at Houghton Mifflin, my publisher, um, to some great editors at Seed. Um, so, so, I mean, they, they really were my... My, my mentors, my teachers, and it really was learning by doing. There, there were lots of failed articles along the way. But, um, but, I mean, you know, I'd always loved writing. What were some of the most challenging differences between writing in a, in a scientific context and ri- writing for other scientists, we'll say, and writing for non-scientists? Did you have to unlearn certain habits or learn new ones you hadn't considered before? Yeah, you know, I... I think one of the hardest things about writing about science for a mass audience um, is is often forgetting what you know. You have to write as as if, as if you were a reader, um, and and that often requires you know forgetting what this acronym means, um, or, and 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 trying you know trying to induce essentially a, a state of not knowing in yourself, um, so that you can read your own writing as if as if you were just a naive reader coming into coming to it for the first time. Um, and I think that's a very tough skill to not write it to over, you know, so it's oversimplified and slightly condescending, um, but 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 to, at the same time, of course, make it understandable um, and and precise. So so that's absolutely something which I, it was very tough to learn. I'm continuing to learn it, um, you know. That but, but but that's also I think one of my favorite challenges of the job of being a science writer, which is I'm convinced one of the great jobs in the world, um, is is taking this very complicated science, and whenever you're writing with the brain, it's bound to be complicated um, and, and mysterious and then you know, shrouded in acronyms, um, and, and to try to make it accessible and interesting and surprising to people, to kind of be able to convey the sense of wonder 
that here we are, we're learning about how, how the brain works. Um, that's a pretty fantastic idea. Sebastian Malaby from The Economist once said that working at The Economist, they were told to presume on the part of the reader great intelligence but no specific knowledge. Is that sort of what you had to do as well? Yeah, um, that's, that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great way of putting it. Um, I think the challenge, and first the neuroscientist for me at least too, was, was it was also, it wasn't just writing about neuroscience, you also had to assume that some people didn't, hadn't read Gertrude Stein or hadn't read The Lighthouse or Miss Dalloway or certainly hadn't read all 3,000 pages of Proust. So, so you kind of have to, you know, you know, so that was a struggle for me, which, which was in a way just as tough, was, was trying to describe the significance of a Virginia Woolf novel or Proust, um, trying to convey enough of the work without making people actually go out and read all of Proust. Um, so, so you know, that was another one of the really, really fun challenges in writing the book was trying to convey these two cultures, these two very different cultures, both which had so much to say about the mind, and and, and yet trying to make it accessible to someone who never read Proust and didn't know Kreb from CPB. Yeah, that was, that was definitely a fun challenge. Now, springing as it does from an article in Seed magazine, your book is, I would say pretty well informed by the seed sensibility. And for those listeners unfamiliar with seed, could you describe what the seed mindset is? Um, I think the tagline kind of says it all, and the tagline underneath seed on the cover of the magazine is science is culture. So the intersection um, between science and, and, and non-scientific elements of human yeah, life? Well, it, it, well, it, I, think, I think it's about the intersection of science and culture. It's also treating science as, as a culture, um, which, which often means kind of getting beyond just the you know, 500-word summary of the latest experiment published in Nature, kind of looking at scientists as personalities, um, as, as even celebrities sometimes today, um, kind of getting the story behind just the 500-word summary you read in the newspaper. About the artists who anticipated this, the discoveries of modern neuroscience in your book, other than Proust, Proust came first. Who came next in your research? Who, who did you find was the next artist to significantly figure out early on what neuroscience would later document for itself. My selection process for this book for finding the artist was, was, pretty, was pretty idiosyncratic. Um, you know, there, there was no particular logic to it. It's kind of, I'd, just, I'd pick up artists, and then once I had this you know, bizarre idea that artists might anticipate neuroscience, I, I couldn't help but read them in terms of this idea. Um, the next one, if I remember correctly, was Walt Whitman, um, who's the first chapter in the book. And, and I remember having to read um, Song of Myself, I, I, I loved Whitman. Um, he's, he'd always been one of my favorite poets. And in reading Song of Myself and having to write an essay about it, and, and all of a sudden this theme of his l- leapt out at me um, about, you know, he says over and over again, the soul is the body, the body is the soul. If the body weren't the soul, then what is the soul? And he's, he's going on and on about the body. Um, and, and, of course, that's, that's one of Whitman's great poetic themes, body enough about the body to get himself banned in Boston. Uh, for you know, for for referring to body parts you're not supposed to refer to, and, and you know, so that really is a consistent theme in his poetry, and it just kind of leapt out at me. And then, and I thought about God. Well, that's pretty prescient. You know, here is Whitman writing in the height of the Victorian era, um, when the body was seen as a source of shame, something to be hidden, and and he's talking about how important it is, how this is where our feelings come from, um, this is where our soul, as he put it, comes from. You know, the body isn't just a machine that feeds the brain; it's an essential part of thought. And, and these are all very modern neuroscientific ideas. Um, you know, much of what we know about the body loop, as it's now referred to, the connection between the mind and the body, comes from people like Antonio Damasio, who have shown, um, you know, just just how you know how our emotions and, and rationality um, even are are really bound, inextricably bound to to the body. And this is, as you put it in the book, a, a rejection of the dualism that had prevailed in art before. Was was is it the the first of its kind? I think, I think Whitman was a pretty unique artist. Um, I mean, everything from his free verse style. Um, he, 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 he was, he, he pioneered his radical way of writing poetry, um, so that it didn't rhyme. Um, and I think his ideas about the body were, were pretty radical as well. I, I mean, yeah, they, they really were radical enough to get him censored, um, to get him criticized as, as writing pornography. Um, even Emerson, who was an early supporter of Whitman, um, and, and wrote him a very generous letter of praise for the first um, Leaves of Grass. By 1860, he was telling you know, Whitman to censor himself, to not write so explicitly about the body, to not talk so much about the body. 
Um, but Whitman, of course, refused because he knew this was his great poetic theme. So, so I think it really was, you know, certainly for a poet like this to, to be so explicit about the connection between the mind and the body and to emphasize it um, as much as Whitman did. I think that was unique. Now, I've, I've moved this past Proust a little quickly, but I think I kind of want to return to him because it, it's been brought up in some reviews that Proust's description of memory and its relation to modern neuroscience has, has not, not become a cliche, but it's become a more wider known thing than everything else that you mentioned with the other artists in the book. So what does Proust tell us about memory for those who are unfamiliar? You know, it, it certainly isn't rare for a neuroscientist, like it's not rare for anyone to invoke the cliche of Proust. Um, I think, I was, you know, to to quote that famous Adeline episode where he dips the cookie in the tea and then he, he, it's really one of the more gorgeous pieces of writing you'll ever read when he describes these childhood memories come flooding back to him. So so certainly scientists have, scientists like like anyone who writes about memory, um, have invoked Proust. Um, I was trying to get beyond just these, the, the tr- those kind of trite allusions to Proust and actually see um, what, what Proust can teach us about memory. Um, and I think Proust can teach us a lot about how our memory works. I mean, just, just, just take that famous Madeline episode um, where Proust it comes about 50 pages into Swan's Way and Proust is sitting there and he's dipping this Madeline, this lemony buttery cookie into his lime flower tea and all of a sudden he gets this, this rush of memories coming back to him, childhood memories that he thought he'd forgotten. And yet there they are, so vivid and, and, and lucid and pristine. One thing leapt out at me when I was reading um, the Madeline episode for the first time, which is Proust's emphasis on taste and smell. He says several times in, in these three or four pages, it's by taste and smell alone that he was able to recover his past, recover these childhood memories. He talks about how he'd seen the Madelines, seen these cookies at Parisian bakeries many times before and, and never remember anything. It wasn't until he dipped the cookie in the tea and the crumbs hit his tongue, that, that, that his childhood came flooding back to him. He had to have um, the taste then. Yeah, he had to have the taste. And, uh, you know, that, that really was a, a prescient, prescient insight. We now know that the olfactory cortex, the part of the brain that processes taste and smell, they really are uniquely nostalgic. Um, it's, it's, it's the only sense that goes directly to the hippocampus, which is the center of long-term memory. All the other senses first go to the thalamus um, and are then sent to the hippocampus. But, but taste and smell go there first. It really does have this primal connection to our memory. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's just a small part of the chapter of, of what Proust understood about memory. But, but I think right there um, just, just gives you a sense of how Proust paid such exquisite attention to, to the act of remembering um, that he really intuited a lot about how our memory works, not just that little you know, funny tidbit of neuroanatomy, but, but many important aspects of memory. Now, how long after Proust wrote his famous epic, did neuroscience prove him right about that? Uh, I, I think the first, the, the, the first studies of, the, of kind of um, how the olfactory cortex connects to the hippocampus, I think come to the 50s and 60s, when, we first really ident- when science first identified the hippocampus. This comes from studies of amnesiac patients. First identified the hippocampus as an essential part of memory formation. And so, you know, you're talking at least half a century after first ate the cookie. You've mentioned that you've, you've read the entire 3,000 pages. Now, are there 3,000 pages worth of, uh, of insight there into, into the workings of memory, or is, did you have to do a lot of slogging through to find the certain nuggets? <laughs> you know, I think Henry James said it best. He, he, he talked about how, how Proust at once wrote some of the most beautiful sentences in English language and also wrote some of the most excruciating sentences, just sentences that are 500 words, 300 words long, and, um, and way too many subclauses to count. So, so there was a certain amount of slog. I think there's also an incredibly good story, a love story. I mean, Proust isn't just writing about memory, he's writing about love and, and jealousy and, and Paris at the turn of the century and all these great subjects. But, but the novel, I think, is in essence an investigation of memory. Um, after Proust dips the cookie in the tea, the novel really begins, the novel takes off. Um, and, and, and Proust frames it as an investigation of his own memory, investigation into his past. So, you know, I mean, certainly, I, I didn't quote from all three thousand pages, or, or even, you know, even more than a few of the three thousand pages. Um, but, but memory really is a recurring theme. Proust constantly returns to the idea of, of his memory, how his memory works, um, what the limits of memory are. Um, he, he really was um, 
writing a novel about his memory. And, and that, that was a matter of, you know, you know he, he, was, he was forced to, in a sense. Proust was a very sickly man, um, was confined to bed. Um, so he, he had no subject but his own memory. Um, and that's what he made a novel out of. It's a pretty common perception outside, I should say, of the field of neuroscience that uh, the memory works like a hard drive and your experiences pile up there and you just you pull it out. If you want to find an experience, you just pull it out of your memory as you would a hard drive. But what did Proust have to say about the way the brain creates a past reality? Proust was pretty skeptical of memory. For a man writing a novel about memory, he was pretty skeptical of memory. Um, he, he says right after he gets this this apparition, he puts it, of, of his childhood, of his past in Combray, he, he immediately warns the reader that it's, that it's a search in vain to, to, to actually look in, you know, look look for the reality of your past. That that there's something inherently dishonest about remembering a memory, um, and and you know it's a it's almost a cynical idea, um, but but it's neurologically accurate. Um, yeah, you know, throughout this novel by memory, Proust is constantly kind of warning us to to not you know to not take him literally, to not take our own memories literally, um, and and that's actually what neuroscience now knows that that if if we used to think of memories like a hard drive. Um, or like some file cabinet in the brain, where once you you know store a memory, it stays there and it stays faithful to what actually happened. Now we know that the act of remembering itself changes the memory. That every time you remember a memory, you suddenly tweak the neuronal structure that that represents that memory. Um, so you know the memories you remember the most, the memories you spent the most time remembering, are in a sense the most dishonest. They've been changed the most from from, from when you first remembered them. So if you really want to remember something, don't think about it until you absolutely <laughs> have to remember it. Yeah, um, and, and that was another Proustian insight. That's, that's why he was so obsessed with, with what Bergson called unconscious recollection. So remembering these childhood memories that you thought you'd forgotten. Um, Proust, Proust, Proust knew that those were the memories that were most honest, the memories we thought we'd forgotten. But the memories we, we constantly rehearse to ourselves, those are the ones we should trust the least. For those just tuning in, my guest is Jonah Lehrer, editor-at-large of Seed Magazine and author of Proust Was a Neuroscientist. We spoke of the taste of the Madeleine cookie triggering Proust's memory, and I want to stay on the subject of taste. What did the art of cooking have to tell us about the recently verified fifth flavor of umami? Uh, well, in, in, in the book I talk about, Auguste Escoffier, um, he was a late 19th century French chef at the Hotel Ritz, the fanciest restaurant in Paris. Um, and, and one thing that always impressed me about Escoffier, I mean, it's just right there on the very first page of his cookbook, which is still still a canonical text for, for many chefs, um, that, that he says right there, he says, stocks are everything. Um, if you've got a good stock, cooking's easy, and if you've got a bad stock, you're wasting your time in the kitchen. That, that always intrigued me, is, is the question of why stocks are so important, why they taste so good. Um, and, and, if, and if you look at the, kind of the old story of the tongue, and when I say old, I mean you know, pre, pre the year 2000, um, we had this theory that goes all the way back to Aristotle, that the tongue can taste four flavors, sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. And that was it. There were just these four taste sensations. And, and, then, and then you go back to a scope and you go, well, well, then why does a stock taste so good? Why, why is... You know, why is Escoffier's basic culinary technique, what about it works so well if that's all we can taste? And I think you can't explain his stocks, which he insisted upon being so important, in terms of these four old taste sensations, these four these, you know, sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. You, you need the fifth taste sensation, which science only recently discovered in the year 2000, that we can actually taste um, the taste of umami, which is the taste of glutamate and the most prevalent amino acid in life. So, so in, in that sense, I think Escoffier, by trying to cook delicious food, by, by paying such close attention to his tongue, figured out how the tongue worked a century before science. And the idea that people could taste and very much enjoy these foods with enough amounts, a uh, high enough amount of L-glutamate, it strikes me as odd that that would be not ignored by science, but not really acknowledged for so long. And was that entirely an effect of the preconception that was established before of the four flavors and people would just, when working in science, adhere to that framework? Or what was the cause of the, uh, the, the failure to acknowledge that? You know, I, I think science, like, like, you know, like any process, has blind spots. And I think it's tough to find something you're kind of looking for. So because we had this, 
idea, this ancient idea of there being forward taste sensations. Um, that's we assume that's that's it. The tongue was solved. Um, so by the turn of the nineteenth, by the end of the nineteenth century, science had even mapped these four different taste sensations with different aspects of the tongue. So bitter was in back, sweet was in front, sour and salty were on the sides, and and that was it. The tongue was solved. Um, so so there didn't seem a, there didn't, you know, there was no need to explain Zielstock to explain why the process of deglazing, which was a scruffy's other big invention, that's where you burn meat in a pan. Um, so it's so the pan is crusted with these burned bits of protein, the fronds. Then you add your stock and deglaze, you know, scrape up all those burned bits of protein with a wooden spoon, and, and make a pan sauce that way. Science had no need to explain why that tasted good, because, because we assumed the tongue was already solved. Now, we chalked up the deliciousness, of, the deliciousness of Scofia's food to perhaps his, you know, he had lots of butter. That's why it tasted good or something. <laughs> uh, he certainly added lots of butter, um, and that's one of the reasons this food tastes so good. But 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 I think we didn't really grapple. We didn't, you know, we didn't ask enough questions. Why does veal stock taste so good? Why does Parmesan cheese taste so good? Why do so many cultures have fish sauces? Um, why do we dip sushi in soy sauce? You know, all these culinary habits that that we now know are so reliant on the taste of al glutamate, the taste of umami, this fifth taste sensation. Scientists should have asked more questions, but I think there was this presumption that the tongue was solved, so so there was no need to ask more questions. I want to move to another scientific blind spot that you mention in the book, and it's on the chapter on George Eliot. And the issue is neurogenesis, whether or not the brain can generate new neurons. And for a long time, as you write, that was believed to be false. The brain could not generate new neurons. And what did George Eliot have to say on that, a similar subject to that? Well, this is one of her recurring themes. She says again and again in her novels that, that, that the mind is, is, is malleable, that you know, the mind is active as phosphorus. So, so she, she, you know, and, and she created characters who, who are defined by their ability to change and to rise above their circumstances. And, 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 she, and this is, of course, situated in a larger intellectual context of, at the time, 19th century, there was a big philosophical debate about determinism, about whether or not humans were determined by the forces of physics or whether or not we were just simply, you know, as Thomas Huxley put it, conscious automata, um, whether or not we were simply prisoners of our um, hereditary, hereditary inheritance, um, whether or not our, our, these, these biological things dictated everything. And George Eliot was a pretty staunch opponent of, of such ideas um, and, and ridiculed them in her books, in her novels. Um, she had some characters who she loved to mock, and, and they were the ones who subscribed to these grand deterministic ideas. So, so, so I mean, she, she obviously isn't, didn't use the word neurogenesis, but she did subscribe to, to this model of the mind as something that can change, change itself. And that is one of the great discoveries of modern neuroscience, that, that our brain is plastic and malleable. Um, and I think the epitome of just how malleable our brain is is the idea of neurogenesis. Um, this is a form of plasticity which, which, which shows that our brain is constantly giving birth to new neurons. And, and that's an idea which, which was pretty much not even considered for most of the 20th century. It, it, was, it was just kind of disregarded as a matter of principle um, that, that after the age of three, our brain stopped making new brain cells, and that's it. You, you, know, you, you had the brain you were going to have, and now we know, of course, that that's not true. Um, but, but that's a very recent idea. Um, it's literally uh, 15 years old. Uh, as, is it the same situation with umami, where there was just a blind spot in terms of the method scientists had been using up to that point, and just a new angle was taken on it, or I mean, that's that's certainly part of it. I, I think people had theories of learning and memory that we couldn't figure out how new cells could be integrated into these neural networks our brain contains. So, so certainly there was a blind, a theoretical blind spot. Um, I think it's, this is a story I tell briefly in the book, but there's also something more interesting going on, which is that the, the very nature of, of the way we kept animals, the way scientists, you know, in, in these very confined cages, be it a rat or a primate, one of the things that really reduces neurogenesis in the brain is stress. Um, and we now know that, that keeping a rat in, in a, and, you know, keeping five rats in a small wire cage or just putting a primate in a cage with a few toys, it's very stressful to these animals. And so what we're essentially studying is brains with vastly reduced neurogenesis. These animals were so stressed that, that, that their brains essentially stopped creating new neurons. Um, because what's the point of having a rich, complicated brain if you're just going to sit in a wire cage? So, so that's, that's, that's the evolutionary logic behind reduced neurogenesis in stressful situations. 
And so I think you know, neurogenesis is always going to be hard to see. It's always hard to observe a few thousand new neurons in a brain full of many millions of neurons. But I think the, the very way we treated these lab animals made it even harder to see neurogenesis. Was that a case of, in the lab, a brain just adapting to the environment that it was given? The uh, less, yeah. less stimulus equaled less development? Absolutely. You're not going to get an enriched brain unless you put the animal in an enriched environment. Um, you know, these animals evolve to live in complicated environments, whether it's a rat or a monkey. Um, and so all of a sudden you take it out of that context and put it in a cage with no toys, no other animals it can, it can play with, and it's going to be very stressed, but it's also going to have an impoverished mind. So it won't feel the need to create as many new neurons. And so that's literally what you see in these animals. So, I mean, obviously neurogenesis, as I said, is going to be very hard to observe no matter what. And I think it's the same thing with the taste of umami because people weren't looking for it. They didn't find it. But I think even if people were looking for it, given the conditions of lab animals, it would have been very hard to see. There's one more element of the George Eliot chapter that I did want to touch on, and that is going back to the what I can only call the determinism craze of her day, what killed that? It's, it's kind of hard to say what killed it. Um, I, I think science eventually realized that, that reality was a little too complicated to explain in such a simplified manner. You know, whether it was quantum physics, which is defined by the idea of indeterminism, it, from, you know, from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle to the very nature of subatomic particles, which, which you can never say exactly where they are. They're just in, you know, electrons are in a cloud, and they're neither here nor there. Um, so, so I think that was one very important point, which kind of knocked determinism away. Two, you know, I think biology subscribed to a form of determinism until pretty recently. Um, I think I think it was projects like the Human Genome Project, um, which the very difficulty we've had in, in pinpointing in, in finding genes to explain so many different things, be it diseases to genes that correspond to the mind. I think show us just how complicated our genome is. How, how it really is a text that is, that is interpreted by something. Um, and, and who we become is such an emulsion of nature and nurture um, and, and the interaction between the two that I think we slowly dismantled this idea of determinism, be it kind of the physical determinism, which was very popular in the 19th century, the idea that if you knew everything about everything, you know, just, just in terms of the physics, you could predict anything, to, to biological determinism. I think we now have a much more nuanced, complicated and accurate understanding of, of just how things happen and why they happen. Um, and and the, the basic moral is that whether, or not, you know, whether you're talking about the plasticity of the mind or, or just how our genome is interpreted by the environment, the basic idea is, is, is that there's elbow room, um, you know, that, that, that we're not strictly determined creatures. Is this a case of science unearthing more and more knowledge and that very knowledge revealing how much work science really has to do? Oh, absolutely. I think it's one of those, I think this so often happens in science where 10 years ago, I think we thought, you know, we had a much clearer understanding of, of some of these big science ideas, and now we know enough to know that we really don't know very much at all. So, so we get kind of glimpses of your ignorance about how much remains to be discovered, and that's, at, you know, at once depressing and inspiring. You know, the brain is fantastically complicated. So even simple processes like the act of storing a memory, you know, I think you can go back 15 years ago and people thought they'd found, you know, be it Kreb or some other kinase enzyme, which was the crucial ingredient to memory. Now we know that it's much more complicated than that, that there are all these things from, you know, perhaps prions to the, you know, the way the act of remembering a memory changes the memory. There are all these other processes which we've since discovered that make memory so much more complicated and interesting. But, but, but I think it certainly is, um, an example of science progressing by kind of learning just how complicated something is. So even if, you know, we thought we might have had the answer 10 years ago, now we know that that answer was just the first draft. What did the post-impressionists know about the way our brains process visual data? I talk about Paul Cezanne, um, the founder of post-impressionism, in my book. And, and I think he had a very, very prescient idea about how we saw. Um, so you know, so if you take the standard notion of seeing, which, which again, existed until rather recently, probably 50 years ago, it, it was that the mind saw like a camera, um, that pixels of light entered our eye, um, and, and then these pixels were developed in the brain just like a piece of film in a camera. Design, thought that was way over 
I, I talk about in the book are some are some of his late paintings, where he, literally the canvas is mostly empty, um, and people at the time um, said, you know, Paul, you haven't finished this painting. I can still see all these blank spots of canvas. And Cezanne just said, no, it's it's done. This is how I meant it to be. You know, see these canvases, and so for example, he he would paint a mountain, um, one of these Provencal mountains, and he'd summarize the mountain, just a single brushstroke, just the the top of the mountain. He painted a single brushstroke. And, and he'd, he'd, he'd summarize the Provencal fields of chestnut trees and vineyards and olive groves in front of the mountain, in the foreground, with just a few, a few brush strokes of brown and green. And the amazing thing is that you can take just this, this bare amount of paint, just these few lines, and, and, and imagine the whole scene. You see the mountain, you see the olive groves, and it's all there. You, the brain naturally fills in all the information that Cezanne left out. Um, I mean, his his brushstrokes are so precise that that they that, that 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 the brain naturally completes them. So the canvas doesn't seem empty, even though it's almost entirely empty space. And I think that that act of painting, which was so radical at its time, Cezanne was really attacked by the critics of the day. Um, I think does get at a very important principle of vision of how we see, which is that vision is much more top down than bottom up. Um, that we're constantly imposing forms onto reality, taking these pixels of light which are hitting the retina and crafting them into forms, be it a bowl of apples or a Provencal mountain, imagining depth and perspective. All these qualities we take for granted in, in vision and in how we see are actually imposed, on, imposed by the mind onto the light entering our eye. And this happened around the, the dawn of the age of photography and in the book, you describe how painters were a little bit afraid of being put out of a job because the photograph can deliver a perfectly representative image. And was this, I don't want to put this in too grand a term, but did this sort of thing save painting? I, I think Cezanne was certainly among a group of painters who were trying to carve out a new niche for painters. Here here they had this piece of technology which all of a sudden could could paint more accurately than any human being. Um, you know, they kind of cornered the market on verisimilitude. So, so I think painters were struggling to find to find a new subject. And I think that's where you first start to see people like Turner, like the Impressionists, um, say, okay, so if the painting, if 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 the, if the camera has accuracy down, if we can't compete on the level of accuracy. Then what can we compete on? I think that's where there is this turn inwards and, and turn towards abstraction. It ties in with, of course, the theme of your book, which the impression I'm getting is that there's really nothing but art that can truly display what we experience inside ourselves. Yes, 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 absolutely. The reason these artists were able to, I think, discover so many important facts about the way our mind works is because they were studying experience. They, they were so, such, such, such sensitive observers of their own experience. Yeah, they were so good at setting their mind from the inside, at introspecting on, on their own sensations and, and their own consciousness. And by observing that, they really were able to discover important truths about how our mind works. And the concept of the truth of art pops up in your book. Is that what makes art true, if it reflects the goings-on of the artist's mind accurately? I mean, I, mean, I, don't, think that's, you know, I don't think that's the only way um, to make art true. I think, in general, I think, yeah, there's a reason we're still reading Hamlet and, and looking at Jackson Pollock drip paintings. And, and you know, I, I mean, great art works because it literally touches a nerve in us. It resonates with some deep part of us. And so I think, you know, for example, I think science can learn a lot about the way the mind works by simply reverse engineering art, by figuring out why we look at a, a, a Pollock painting. What is it about these drips of paint arranged in this, this seemingly random way which, which strikes us as so beautiful? And so I think by, by trying to figure out how the art works, you can learn a lot of you can learn a lot about how the mind works. So, so you know, there isn't a single way for art to be relevant or true or meaningful. Um, I think that's what makes art so interesting, that there is no simple formula. But I think any time art does work, it works because, it, it, because these artists have intuitively figured out how, how art should resonate, um, how art can resonate in the mind. Could you have written the book by just picking the names out of a hat of artists whose work has stood the test of time? Or could it have only been the ones you picked out? It, it certainly couldn't have been um, just these eight artists. Absolutely not. Um, I mean, you know, I hope this book is merely suggestive. I, I, I hope it just begins a dialogue about how art and science might, might be able to inform each other. Um, I also don't think I could have just picked anybody. Um, 
I mean, I, I chose these artists because they were some of my favorite artists, but also because I think they also, I, I, I could tell particularly interesting stories about their own art and about the, the science they anticipated. Um, but, but certainly, I think, you know, you can also look at, you learn a lot about the visual cortex by studying Jackson Pollock. Um, you know, I, I could have talked about Samuel Taylor Coleridge and the imagine. I mean, there's so many artists I left out of the book who I wanted to put in, but for reasons of, of space and stuff, had had to leave out. Um, so certainly, these eight artists aren't an exhaustive list. They are merely, you know, I hope, just a mere suggestion. If you received a particularly lucrative book contract for a sequel, something that you just couldn't turn down, but you had to l use only living artists, could you? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think we are living in a time when, when, when many people are engaging with neuroscience and trying to write about the mind. Um, you know, last year's National Book Award winner, uh, The Echo Maker by Richard Powers, was a fantastic novel, and this is just one example, um, written about a, a real neurological syndrome there. Hopgrass Delusion. The novel is a great meditation on the self and consciousness, identity, and, and all these grand topics. But but it's inspired by neuroscience. I, in my own book, by talking about Ian McEwan Saturday, um, a, a novel which was inspired by he spent two years falling around a neurosurgeon. It's full of descriptions of the brain and how the brain gives rise to the mind. I mean, so those those, those are just two examples. Um, but I think there are you know many great artists right now who are not only making art which resonates with us. And, and like I said before, anytime art resonates with us, you can learn, you can hopefully learn about um, the mind. But I think directly engaging with neuroscience, asking relevant questions about what the science means, using the science as a springboard to explore these grand metaphysical questions. So yeah, ab absolutely. I, I could write a book about artists and scientists today. In the book you reference, C.P. Snow's original Two Cultures lecture, back from 1959, I believe, where he described the humanities and the sciences as having closed off into isolated camps. How do you see the situation today? Has it improved or has it gotten worse? Is it about the same? I think I, you know, I think it's one of those moments of taking a few steps forward and a few steps back. I think, like I said, we, we do have um, novelists um, writing great novels about modern neuroscience. At the same time, I think our two cultures are, in general, farther apart than ever. I think their their vocabularies at this point are, are it's very tough to figure out how they could even have a dialogue because they use such different languages. Science, of course, uses the language of acronyms and chemistry and enzymes. Artists use metaphor and poetry and plot and characters. It's very tough to you know to even imagine how they might come together. And that's that's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book to imagine what a dialogue might look like. You know, but I think in a sense they have grown farther apart. Um, neuroscience is very reductionist. It, it describes the brain by trying to break it apart. It's tough to figure out how, how you can take all these pieces of neuroscience, all, all the parts neuroscience has found, and, and try to mesh that with other ways of knowing, um, knowing ourselves. And in recent decades, there's been an emergence of what has been termed the third culture, although that's become something less than a merging of the two cultures. And you've written a little bit about how it's been a slight disappointment. What are your thoughts on that third culture? Well, I think, I think too often what we refer to as third culture now is scientists just describing their own science. So people like Stephen Pinker, Richard Dawkins, and, and these are people who, who I, I have nothing but the highest amount of respect for, who, who are great scientists and have taught the public much about their science. But, it, but I think C.P. Snow originally defined a third culture as a culture which could bring our two cultures together. And I think that's what we need to get back to. Um, I think we, you know, of course need scientists to, to popularize their work. I think that's very important. Um, but at the same time, we also need this other culture which, which can bring our two cultures, art and science, the humanities, and, and neuroscience and physics together. Um, and, and I think that's, that's sorely missing. That's what you know, this, this, this book I hopefully fills, fills a slight void in that sense of, of trying not just to explain the science or write about a novel, but, 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 bring, but bring these two very different ways of understanding the mind together and, and seeing how they are, even though they might seem like such different descriptions of the mind and, and the brain, they are, they are ultimately descriptions of the same thing, which is human mind and human nature. Would you like your book, ideally, to be the kickoff of the emergence of, as you put it in the book, a fourth culture? <laughs> well, that, that, uh, that certainly would. Uh, that, that's, you know, when I let my daydreams uh, <laughs> out of control. That's certainly where they end up. 
certainly maybe change the way they read Proust or read Virginia Woolf or, or look at any of their favorite art to, to, to at least try to imagine this dialogue when people pick up a novel or read about some science experiments to, to try to trespass on these boundaries between these two cultures, you know, to read a novel in terms of neuroscience and to look at a neuroscience experiment so that it reminds them of their favorite painting. You started blogging before Proust was a neuroscientist was released. Your blog is Frontal Cortex. What brought you to the conversation that is the blogosphere? <laughs> um, I imagine the same thing that brings anyone to the blogosphere. Um, perhaps a little too much time on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> some, some, uh, you know, perhaps a trace of loneliness in there. I, I, I don't know. I've, I've, I've certainly enjoyed it. Um, for me, you know, we, we talked earlier about um, learning how to write, and I think blogging, if nothing else, is, is great practice. Um, you're, you're, you're always writing. You're always trying to convey ideas to other people. Um, and, and certainly, because it's the internet and the blogosphere, you're always going to get lots of criticism. So, so you know, it, it, is, it is a great, for me at least, um, it's a great form for learning how to write and practicing that skill. Your book has received uh, many, many positive reviews, but an interesting thing you've done with your blog is to engage the writers of, now they're not exactly negative reviews, but of the, the mediocre reviews you've received from the web mags, especially Salon and Slate. And it, it's kind of unusual because you've done, you've, you've responded rather to the reviews themselves without just kind of slagging them off. And what have you learned from engaging with these less than positive reviews? You know, I, it's always great to, to, to get criticism. And certainly, and this is something I you know, was always thinking about when I was writing the book was, you know, I'd always tell myself, you know, Proust really wasn't a neuroscientist. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, I, yeah, that's that's something I'm always trying to do, at least, um, is to is to cultivate this kind of self criticism. But the, but you know, I think especially there there was a review in Slate, um, which which you know I, I think raised some criticism of the book, and I I tried to respond to them, and and I think some of them some of them were fairer than others. Um, but you know, but but I know this the book is kind of audacious. It it, it is kind of a surprising idea. Um, and, and, and I do want people to be surprised by it and, and to perhaps disagree with me. But, but I hope, if nothing else, that, that they just engage with, with the ideas. And, and perhaps they don't think Proust is a neuroscientist or that George Eliot anticipated plasticity. But at the very least, I think this is a conversation we should be having about how art and science might, might be having a conversation, might be having a dialogue, might be coming back together. Even if you really disagree with the book and, 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 and don't think that art is capable of participating neuroscience that at least triggers dialogue. Once again, the book is Proust Was a Neuroscientist. Jonah Lair, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Frontal Cortex, Jonah Lehrer's blog, is available at www.scienceblogs.com slash cortex. Our music is composed by Ben Althaus. He also goes under the names Ice Ben and DJ Concept. Check out his website, www.benalthouse, that's B-E-N-A-L-T-H-O-U-S-E, dot com. Find our complete show archive, our Frapper map, and more on our website, www.colinmarshallradio.com, slash marketplace.